guys, we continue with our coverage of our secret weapon after Queen C2 castles to play the move knight to f3. Might not be so secret anymore, especially not after this series, but for now it does have pretty good surprise value. An opponent that is not surprised will most of the time play the move c5 here. This is the reply endorsed by theory and it is a pretty good move. White only has one sensible move here, surprisingly, which is to take on c5. Everything else leaves black with a decent position. And here we, black is once again at a bit of a crossroads. The most natural move might be bishop takes c5. However, this is not the main line at all and also not a move to be afraid of. And to explain why, I have to show you a slightly different position, which we will come across later in the series actually. But after the move c5 instead of castles on move 4, which is another main line, white also takes. Here the main move is castles. And now knight f3 of course would transpose to the position we just saw on the board. But instead the main move instead of knight f3 is once again a3 and now black takes on c5. And there we can see that we spent a tempo on the move a3 to force black to take there. While a3 is quite a bit less useful than knight f3 which white would normally play there. Even in these lines white is supposed to have good chances for an opening advantage. But not having committed the pawn on f3 to f3 gives us even more chances. And this is the reason the move bishop takes c5 is not very popular in this position and rightly so. Of course we're not playing a3, we play a useful move, bishop f4. Bishop g5 is equally good, but I like putting my bishop on f4 in these positions. And pretty much no matter what black does, he won't have an easy life. White more often than not will just follow up with e3 followed by developing bishop e2 castles putting a rook on d1. Of course a3 can be a useful move sometimes but you don't have to make it a, excuse me, a priority here. I recently had a game where black played b6. I went e3, bishop to b7 and bishop to e2. Black played the move bishop e7 which might look a bit strange but it's actually quite typical. First of all, it slightly threatens knight to h5 when our bishop doesn't have a good square to go. And secondly, the bishop on e7 kind of gets out of the way from the c file where it's not really well placed. Because black either sometimes he wants to go knight a6, knight c5. I don't think that's such a good idea here. But he also wants to create some counterplay with knight c6, rook c8 and maybe knight a5 in some lines. So bishop e7 is not such a weird move, but still I just played the move h3 pairing that knight h5 threat by creating a square here and I think I had a pretty pleasant position. I just followed up with castles rook fd1 and saving on the move a3 really can make a difference here even though we did spend it on the humble move h3 here, but that made a lot of sense. Similar, similarly, <laughs> after bishop e2 knight c6, also fairly natural move, now we can castle and I think white once again maintains a very pleasant position with the idea of rook d1, let's say h3 when it's needed to stop knight h5, a3, b4, rook c1. Black always suffers from the weakness of his d6 square and his d7 pawn. So bishop takes c5, nothing to be afraid of, actually something to hope for. Instead, the reason why knight f3 does not have that high standing theoretically, even though it has changed a bit recently, is the move knight to a6. This is very much in the spirit of the Nemzo. Black is fighting for the e4 square. He wants to go knight takes c5 and take control of the e4 square, leaving his bishop on b4 if he has to give it up on c3. And it's kind of trying to expose the drawback of knight f3 that white no longer so easily can control the e4 square by putting a pawn on f3 for example. So knight a6 is the main line and with good reason. Here white has more than one option. Morozevich in particular has played the move c6 quite a bit. I'm not a big fan of this move, gotta tell you. If black plays the correct b takes c6 capturing towards the center and after g3 a move like d5 or even the move knight to c5 I think he gets a pretty decent position. 
So C6 never made that much sense to me, but it's certainly something to look into if you get bored with the main line with my recommendation, which is just to continue development and play G3. We want to go bishop g2, castles, and if black comes up with nothing concrete, we will have a nice positional advantage. However, unfortunately, there are some more or less concrete ways. Black follows with his idea of knight takes c5, white goes bishop to g2. And here the main move, which I'm not going to show you in this video, but uh, just to prepare you mentally for the next one, in which I might or might look not have longer hair and look 10 years older, is the move knight c to e4, trying to give us a doubled pawn on c3 by taking on c3 either with the bishop or the knight. However, there are alternatives which have been played quite a bit recently in practice as well, and I want to cover those in this video. The other main line is the move b6, which is very logical as well. Black wants to go bishop b7, once again fighting for the key e4 square and creating an opponent for our mighty bishop on the long diagonal. So b6 is a solid move and it has appeared in practice quite a bit. For now, black doesn't do much, white doesn't do much. He, he just castles and black once again has a choice. The most natural move is bishop to b7, but sometimes black chooses to take on c3 deliberately. I will explain you the reasoning behind this when we look at bishop to b, bishop b7. But for now, let's assume he takes, queen takes, and plays bishop b7. Once again, white has the two bishops pretty much for free, and I think white is better here. I like the move b3, tending to put the bishop on b2, or even on a3, depending on circumstances. But most of the time we'll go to b2 after, let's say, queen e7, bishop b2. I think white is just a little better. It's not the end of the world for black because he did manage to oppose the other bishop quite well. But white does have an advantage because of his well-coordinated pieces and his bishop pair. So bishop takes c3 is nothing to worry about. Bishop b7 looks much more natural and frankly looks fine for black. But here white has one very important little subtlety. Since we cast the next move, last move, we can now move our knight, and we should. We should go knight to b5. Doesn't look so sophisticated, but it leaves the black pieces a bit hanging in the air, and it creates a threat of a3, but at the same time it keeps an eye on the weakened squares d6 and c7. So this is the move to try here. When black has to do something about this threat of a3, and he normally plays the move bishop e4, and once again, I will show you the lesser played move first. It's a reasonable move, knight c e4. It has been played in a game, I believe, Rajabov against Nisi Peanu. But white is better here. And he emphasized this by putting his next knight on the fifth rank with knight g5. That game went, and I think that was more or less best play, d5, rook to d1. An important move, even though knight takes e4 is all right as well. And now after queen e7, a3, black is facing some trouble with his bishop once again. Game went a6. Did it? Oh, I'm sorry, I might have... Yeah, I missed one intermediate move. We don't go a3 immediately, we take on e4 first. My apologies, we go knight takes e4, knight takes e4, and now a3. Still, the idea remains the same, annoy this bishop. If we went bishop c5 after bishop e4, d takes e, b4 would already be in serious trouble. So instead, after a3, black went a6, sorry, a6. But here, white once again got a very pleasant edge after a, b, a, b, rook a8, rook a8, and the move c takes d5. e takes d was played, and bishop e3. And I hope I'm not starting to bore you with my bishop pair speech yet, but once again, we're better because we have the bishop pair. b6 is weak. There is an entry square on c7. d5 is a bit weak. White is seriously better. So knight c e4 doesn't really solve black's problems. Bishop e4 is the best move here. Kicking our queen back. Only one legal move not to lose it, so we should do that and play queen d1. 
Here, last crossroads for today. Once again, white is trying to occupy the d6 square and threatening a3, b4. One thing black could do is to pretend to fall into our trap with a6. And after knight to d6, play the move bishop c6. His point is that after the move a3, which looks like it's winning material, he does have the clever little resort bishop to a4. And all of a sudden, our queen is being harassed a little bit. However, no one ever does this with white, but I'm not 100% sure why. Because even if we fall for black's trap with bishop a4 and play b3 here, I think white's play is quite interesting. Black has to play bishop takes b3, convince yourself nothing else works. And now just queen to d4, black should go bishop to a5, move knight to e5, black should go rook to b8 because his rook is under attack on a8, and bishop to f4. White is a pawn down, but if we look at his very powerful control over the dark squares and in the center, if you ask me, I would choose white in this position. I think it's much more unpleasant to play with black. Objectively, black might be able to hold, but I would not really mind going for this with white. So if you're feeling adventurous, this is a very possible option after the move. Knight b5, bishop e4, queen d1, and a6. Just a brief repetition here. However, it's not forced if you don't feel like sacrificing a pawn. You can also play the typical move, bishop to f4. Now bishop a4 is clearly pointless because of b3. So normally black instead fights for the dark squares and against the knight on d6, which is quite powerful. Goes knight to b7 back. And after rook c1, I believe white keeps a little edge. Nothing that spectacular, but it's still a little better for white. Typical play is something like knight d6, bishop d6, bishop d6, queen d6, and queen b8, let's say. But even the pure ending after queen takes b8, rook takes b8, rook fd1 is still a bit more pleasant for white. So you have a choice here between more adventurous pawn sacrifice and solid play with a little plus. Nothing to scare us really. However, a6 is not the end of the story yet. Black more often plays immediately the move knight to b7. <clears throat> which looks a bit funny once again, but it does create a retreat for the bishop and it does control the d6 square, which was under white control before this one. And once again, white is at a bit of a crossroads. The more entertaining way to play is to play the move a3, bishop goes back to e7, move the knight back to c3, the the goal of the expedition has kind of been achieved to uncoordinate black's pieces a little bit. Black would go bishop c6, keeping his bishop, and just to play queen to c2, and playing a slow game with all the pieces on the board. Next we want to go rook to d1. Once again we have the option of going bishop to f4. Sometimes we have the option of going e4, followed by e5 even. I don't think white has much here, I'll be honest with you, but I think it is a very playable position with decent chances to outplay your opponent, even though objectively white can't claim all that much of an advantage here. After knight b7, the alternative is the very solid move and the main line, bishop to f4, and after a6, now to go for the move knight to d6. Here, once again, black should and will exchange everything on d6. Queen takes d6 and typically play the move queen to b8. This is not forced, but it is quite a standard measure to get rid of this mighty queen from d6. Here, I believe the most precise is to just go for the ending yet again. Go queen takes, rook takes and play rook fd1. Slightly better version for black than the end game we've just seen, but I don't think it's dead draw or over yet. White still has slightly the better chances. His ideas of knight e5, ideas of rook to d6, and the black's queen side is slightly, slightly weakened, so 
White is a little bit better here. I'm not going to claim a winning advantage, but it is certainly a risk-free playable ending. And if you prepare, prefer more pieces on the board, you can choose the other line I gave. So that's it about the main alternative to knight ce4, the move b6. Before we close, I will briefly mention another alternative, less popular and rightly so. It's the move d6, intending to put the pawn on e5 and also to go for a setup with bishop to d7, followed by, if necessary, bishop to c6. After d6, white just castles, just like you would against b6. Black normally plays the move bishop d7. If you started with e5 immediately, white could just develop with bishop e3, followed by rook d1, and once again be happy about the weaknesses in black's camp. So normally they go bishop d7, and here I think it's worth even spending a tempo on provoking that e5 move. I like the move bishop to f4. I don't want a black, I don't want black to allow, to be allowed <laughs> to go bishop c6 with impunity without having challenged him anywhere. I think bishop f4 is a decent little test. After e5, now we just go bishop e3. Even though we lost the tempo, I still believe white is better here. Once again, it's quite easy to play. Put a rook on d1 and enjoy your advantage. So d6, you won't see it that much and it's nothing to be afraid of. But for completeness sake, I included it and I will include one more move for very completeness. The move knight fe4. This is worse than knight ce4 because the knight does not clear the way for the bishop and the knight on f6 was just better placed than the knight on c5. So knight fe4, bunch of tempting choices. One move that looks a bit silly but is quite playable is the move bishop to e3. If white is feeling extra cautious, he can also play bishop d2 and claim a little advantage. But the most natural is after knight fe4 to just castle and allow black to double our pawns with bishop c3, b takes c. And here white, even though his pawns do look ugly, keeps a bit of an edge because his other pieces are so active and the black knights are a bit uncoordinated. We want to follow up with knight to d4, let's say d6, knight d4, f5. Now, pulling that knight on b3 could make some sense, having provoked f5, intending to kick the other knight back with f3. Bishop goes to e3 quite often, or to f4. And white keeps a little edge. Typical line is bishop d7, f3, knight f6. Knight takes c5, closing that c file. d takes c5, bishop to f4, where white I think it is a little bit better because of his control over this diagonal. But there is other more solid ways to play as well and knight fe4 is not a move you're gonna face all that often. The move you will face very often instead is the move knight ce4 and in the next video I will hopefully help you to deal with that one. Thanks for your attention and see you in the next one where I'm much older. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from onlinechesslessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you uh, in my videos. Thank you.